Luke chapter 22, and the main text will be starting in verse 47. I don't know if you guys can imagine having a close friend, one you've known for years, someone who has been with you through thick and thin. I mean, you guys shared laughter and pain and meals and deep conversations. This is a friend that you've trusted with your secrets, maybe one that you've turned to in hard times. Now imagine discovering that that friend has been secretly working against you. I'm talking about undermining your efforts, sharing your deepest secrets with those who wish you harm. The pain that you would experience here would, wouldn't just be from the betrayal itself, but the fact that it comes from someone that you loved and trusted so deeply. And this story, unfortunately, is not just hypothetical for some. For one, history is filled with betrayal from those closest to people. Y'all know the famous Julius Caesar, famously stabbed by his friend Brutus, and he reportedly said, et tu, Brute, right? And you, Brutus, right? Expressing his shock that even those he trusted deeply, a trusted ally, was part of this conspiracy to kill him. The pain of the physical wound was just magnified by the emotional damage of the betrayal. For many of us, the deepest hurts in our life don't come from strangers, but come from those who are closest to us. Betrayal by a friend or a family member cuts deep because it breaks not just the trust, but the the core of the relationship, right? Right? It gives us questioning, like, all the moments that we had that we thought were sincere. Every word and every expression of affection, we're like, was that even real? And as we look at our text today, we find Jesus experiencing this very pain. And it wasn't a shock to him, he actually predicted it would come. It's definitely a shock to his disciples. Judas, one of his closest disciples, someone who had walked with him, learned from him, shared in his ministry, is about to betray Jesus with a kiss. Just meant to convey love and loyalty. And in this moment, we see not only the dark treachery of Judas, but also the loving light of Jesus, of Christ. The incredible depth of Jesus' love as he faces the ultimate dark act of betrayal with grace and resolve. One of the darkest acts someone can commit against us is a betrayal, and a betrayal of a close friend at that. And our natural response to that type of darkness, when it's thrown at us, is one of an an impulse and, and revenge and aggression. This story invites us not only to reflect on the times we have been betrayed, but I think even more so, as we're going to get into this, into that, Maybe some of the ways we might betray Christ in our own lives. This text is filled with darkness. From the cover of the night, this is the middle of the night, it was dark at night. And it's really a theme that reveals the hearts of people. But also the act of betrayal by Judas. The dark response to that act by the disciples. The wicked authorities unlawfully arresting innocent Jesus. Acts of moral darkness against us is something we will face as followers of Jesus. Dark trials and temptations will be a part of this life, but how do we deal with the darkness that this life throws at us? We see Jesus responds to darkness with his light, and he wants his followers to do the the same. One of the major things that we see is that when darkness and evil rise up against you, you must respond to darkness with the light of Jesus. Followers of Christ must respond to acts and times of darkness in their lives directed at them with the light of Jesus. Now, before we get into our main text of the morning, I want to do recap and finish out our, 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 our last point from last week. As we saw in the, text, in the verses 39 through 46, Disciples of Jesus must commit themselves to prayer as the primary means of preparation for trials and temptation. 
We also saw that we should pray for the avoidance and removal of trial and temptation, but ultimately be willing to submit to God's plan if temptation and trial would be necessary. We saw that in verses 40 and through 42 and verses, the last part of verse 46. We also saw that we must incorporate fervency in prayer, seeing Jesus as he's fervently praying, as he, the text says earnestly was the word, right? But we also saw in that text, God's comfort and grace is even more abundant through prayer. We see even in the midst of Jesus agonizing in prayer, the angel, a minister of a comfort, is there with him. And last week, yeah, we saw the importance of prayer before temptation, during temptation, and after. Listen, we're never going to face the type of trial to the degree that Jesus faces here, but when we suffer, especially for Christ's sake, we do share in Christ's suffering, as we see in other parts of Scripture. And prayer is essential. Jesus repeatedly stressed the importance of prayer to prep them, his disciples for what's to come, but that fell on deaf ears. The disciples have not learned this lesson, yet at the end of the text from last week, Jesus finds them falling to their flesh and failing to do what he earnestly and repeatedly asked them to do, and that was stay up and pray. We see here in verse 46 that prayer requires self-denial and effort, and the message to us from Jesus is that do not get weary in prayer, but rise up and continue to pray. So the disciples, let's just read 45 and 46 again. And he rose up from prayer. Jesus rose up from this, this, this season of prayer that he had. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise up, rise and pray, excuse me, that you may not enter into temptation. The disciples were very sad that Jesus, at what Jesus had been saying, and the fact that he's saying that he would depart from them. It was a long day. And instead of going to Jesus, instead of praying with Jesus in their sorrow, they succumb to sleep. Now, sleep is actually a common response to people in sorrow. It's just easier to go to sleep and not think about your problems. Let's ball up, and maybe you can wake up and fast for a time, and the problem had worked itself out. You ever thought about that? I know in school, I wished I could, like, you know, go to sleep, and then a clone of me would do all the work I needed to do to get the school done, and I'll wake up, and it'll be done, all right? But that's not how life works. It's easy to sleep your problems away. Jesus needed them up and praying so he, they could be spiritually ready to face one of the darkest times of their lives. The disciples really had no idea, despite being warned of the trial and temptation, uh, what was awaiting them. Seeing their Messiah arrested, betrayed, brutalized, and left alone would be the darkest experience for them that they would ever face. And Jesus realized how much they needed to pray even more when they were wanted to sleep. Fact is, if we knew the type of trials and satanic attacks and temptations that would, would await us, if we knew the spiritual warfare that's going on right now and the devil's plan to destroy us, we would take prayer way more seriously than we do. We must take Jesus at his word, walk by faith and not by sight, and recognize that we desperately need divine intervention and sustenance to face the spiritual battles that will come our way. This habit of going to, out to an isolated place and to pray was not just a one-time thing, but a pattern of Jesus' life, right? If we're going to have spiritual power and endurance and trial, it's not going to come through just, you know, sporadic, isolated prayers, one-time prayer events, but a pattern of and persist, a pattern of persistence in prayer. One of the reasons, church, that we, we fold in trial is because we have not developed a habit of consistent prayer. Sometimes the prayer just turns on when we're in trial, but when we're at times of ease, it's like, oh, put the foot off the gas. Yeah, man, it's, you know, things are going well. For strength and spiritual vitality, for protection, for the power to do his will, we must commit our life to prayer. If Jesus, the Son of God, the God-man, depends so much on prayer to do the will of the Father, how much more should we? Prayer in the midst of sorrow or good times require grace and power, self-denial and effort. It's not easy. The devil wants to do anything he can to distract us from prayer, right? 
Just uh, think about all the moments of clarity about some problem that you have to figure out at work is going to come when it's time to pray, and you're going to think through that, all right? But it requires grace-filled self-denial and self-effort. If we were really aware of the spiritual battles and trials to come, we would be on our knees way more. If we were aware of the darkness and the hurt that people are going through and will go through, we would be in prayer a lot more than we are, church, both individually and corporately. How often has Jesus found you doing everything else but prayer? Not only is prayer the primary of reason how we talk to God, one of, the, one of the primary reasons how we grow our relationship to him, it is vital for protection and strength and victory in times of trial and testing, and spiritual testing. So church, my message to you at this point is the same as Jesus when he wakes the disciples up from sleeping while they were, uh, when they should have been praying, and that is rise up, rise and pray. Rise up and pray. Whether you're in trial or coming out of one, experienced in temptation or just had victory, rise up and pray consistently. Pray fervently. Pray knowing that the God of grace and power and comfort hears you, and you have a Savior who is sympathetic to your pain and temptation and, and feels what you have gone through, and he will hear you and strengthen you. We must continue to follow Jesus as we face trials of changing circumstances and let us commit ourselves to prayer so we can be ready to continue to follow Jesus during times of darkness and trials and temptation. Again, the disciples had not learned this lesson at all, right? And they were not ready for the biggest trial they would face until this point. And it was moments away. And moments away is really an understatement because as Jesus is talking to the disciples, here comes the, the marching band. And they're not carrying trumpets, right? They're carrying knives and, and, and staves, right, and, and clubs, and they're people of authority. And Judas, the betrayer, is leading them. Trials, temptations, and seasons of darkness do not warn you before they arrive, right? They're like, hey, guess what? I'm, you know, in, in two weeks at 7 o'clock, this is going to happen, right? No, a lot of times your trials and spiritual tests come up all of a sudden, only dependent prayer and the grace of Jesus can make you ready. Look at verses 47 to 48 as we get in our main text, as we look at the lessons from the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. 47 to 48 with me. While, Je while he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? We see that we must reject the spirit of betrayal in our own hearts. But the text makes it clear that this event was happening as Jesus was in the midst of talking to the disciple. This whole scene would have been like a roller coaster of emotions to the disciple. For one, an armed authorities are coming to arrest Jesus. Temple police and chief priests and elders are closing in on Jesus. And on top of that, their friend, Judas, who... Remember, they had no idea was the traitor. He was, he was leading them, and Judas was also uh, Jesus' friend. Judas saw his kindness and mercy and his power and miracles up close. Jesus knows that Judas would betray him and still showed him love, patience, and served him like he did the rest of the disciples. He didn't discriminate knowing what Judas would become. Yet Judas hardened his heart against Jesus and is leading the enemies of Jesus to arrest him and put him to death. He has the audacity to greet the one he was delivering up with a kiss. Again, this greeting was a symbol of friendship and love, and Jesus was using this affectionate symbol of a, of a kiss to stab in the back the best friend anyone could have. This would have been a scene that was as cruel and distasteful to the highest order. Again, can you imagine your best friend that you have done so much with selling you out, and in the act of selling you out, before that happens, he embraces you or she embraces you with a hug. Jesus is calling out the hypocrisy of Judas and says, you, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Have you fell so low, Judas, that you betray the Messiah with a kiss? This is the most scandalous and notorious betrayal of all time because Judas, who had been shown so much kindness and seen so much of 
the purity and love of Christ up close is betray, it betrays his Lord. Now there is only one Judas, and his betrayal will, will ever be uniquely horrific and infamous. But we have moments of betrayal in our lives on varying levels. Even his disciples, right after this, meaning although they were not Judas, right after this, Peter denies his Lord three times in a very passionate fashion. The other disciples leave, him, leave Jesus behind and forsake him, leaving him alone out of fear. That was a form of betrayal. My point is that you don't have to completely turn your back on the Lord and become his enemy to actually have actions of betrayal against Jesus. We must guard our hearts against all types of betrayal against our Lord. Now, let me just say this, though. I, I know we don't think we could ever turn our hearts completely against our Lord, but many who do, who do that, like Judas, did not think that was going to, did not start off with that intention. Many scholars, and I agree, think Judas was, was, was sincere in following Jesus as the Messiah at first. Although not a true dis, uh, disciple, he was, you know, his, he thought he was the Messiah, and he sincerely followed him at first. This is not explicit in, in, in the Gospels, but many believe one of the reasons that uh, he turned against the Lord, the Messiah, because Jesus was not the Messiah that Judas expected him to be, wanted him to be. A Messiah of earthly power who would bring power to Israel, overthrow Rome, and reign now on this earth, and give Israel this position of standing. He became increasingly disillusioned and hardened against this Jesus' true message, and he turned against Jesus. Listen, there are many professing followers of Jesus that when darkness hits their life, I'm talking about real pain and hurt, when an evil trial happens that they did not understand or can't get why a good God will allow such horrible things, they turn against the Lord. And I know I, I can tell you testimony of people, this is their case for turning against the Lord. They have an idea of who they think God is and how he should act and when he should act. And when the Lord does not act in their box, in, their, in the way that he thinks they should act, he should act, they turn against him. And we must be careful that our loyalty to Christ is independent of whatever we, of whatever we experience in this life. I just heard from a preacher that when we realize that we deserve hell... And God gave us salvation and brought us into his family. And we have a home in heaven. And we have the spirit of Christ in us. Everything after that is just a bonus. And we should be grateful for any of it because it's more than what we deserve. We don't deserve salvation. So if you woke up this morning with air in your lungs and clothes on your back and a house over your head, that is just icing on the cake. God is a good God, and we don't deserve any of it. So how dare we blame God and accuse God when we face hard times? And that's, I think, part of the reason Judas was, man, he was not doing what I thought he was. He's not the God I thought he was. He's not the Messiah that I thought he was. He's a fake Messiah. Let's turn against him. But maybe it's not to that level. We still should honestly ask ourselves, what are the ways in, in which, we, uh, which we experience the sin of betrayal to the Lord and ask the Lord to reveal it in our own hearts? For Judas to betray Christ, he had to block and push out all the times that Jesus served him. He was gracious to him. He gave him counsel, block out all the miracles and the power that he had seen Jesus do. And this is often what we do when we choose to block, we choose to block out everything the Savior has done for us so we can, so we can sin against him. Listen, it may not look like being tempted to reject the Savior altogether, but we manifest actions of betrayal in more ways than we would like to admit. Our Savior has saved us from sin and judgment. He has given us his spirit. He has been so good to us in more ways we can count, but yet we often choose sin over loyalty to Christ in more ways than we can count as well. Jesus can work in our lives in a great way or bless us with something that we did not deserve. And then the next day, we shrink when it's time to be a light for him in front of our unsaved co-workers. Some may choose sexual lust over satisfaction with Christ and re after repeatedly telling the Lord you are done and would change. 
Some may choose their own comfort and social standing over being a witness for Christ. Some may choose to curse out a, a, a person or blow, out, a, a blow, a, a blow up at them in anger instead of showing love and pa- the patience of Christ that he gives you when you don't deserve it. Though we are not Judas, let us ask God for grace to root out any spirit of betrayal in our own hearts. Let us, like the psalmist, humbly say, search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. What are the areas in your life where you're most vulnerable to sin against your Savior? What can you do to make it hard in those areas to betray Jesus and easy to honor Christ? What protections do you need? What accountability, counseling, changing of schedules, or friendships that you need to uh, reorient? Let, Let us take this seriously, church. Let us choose loyalty and obedience to Christ over betrayal and self pleasure. Listen, if we really put our our minds on the holiness of God and the goodness of God and all the the Lord has given us, starting with salvation, we realize that every sin is a betrayal of Jesus. Yet he faithfully loves and forgives us and restores us. All of us have and will continue to sin against our Lord who loves us so much, but Because he loves us so much and because he forgives us, let us be motivated to every day seek to allow our hearts to be sanctified that we may reject every form of betrayal in our hearts and depend on the grace to stay faithful to him. Every day, Lord, help me to be more loyal to you today than I was yesterday. And the next day, that's sanctification, right? You're not going to just make a decision, man, boom, I'm 100% loyal to uh, Jesus with no cracks. It's not going to happen. But by grace, he can make you be more loyal each day. One of the ways we betray Christ or sin against him is sometimes how we respond to those who are enemies in Christ to seek us to do us home, harm. We could, with good intention, want to serve Christ, but serve Christ in a sinful way. And we see that we must reject the reactionary fleshly response to attacks from our enemies and respond with the light of Jesus. Let's look at the next section here, uh, verses 49 and 51, if you can. In verse 49, it says, And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. The disciples, with the desire to protect their Lord, immediate response to this threat was one of violence. I mean, Jesus just said, Make sure you have your swords. So they asked the Lord, is it, is it now the time to use the two swords we have? All right. One of the disciples, known for his impulse, impulse, uh, impulsivity, John tells us, in the uh, Gospel of John tells us it was Peter, he did not wait or ask for permission. He was all action and no talk, took the sword and cut off the servant, the servant in the high priest's ear. Peter was about that life, right? He was a ride or die disciple, right? When he said that he wanted to stand with Jesus until death, and here it shows that he was sincere, uh, although he later, later fa- uh, failed, he was sincere in this immediate moment. He was ready to fight, no questions asked. He reminds me of the commentator I read was referring to uh, a man who served under uh, George Washington. He was nicknamed Mad Anthony Wayne, and he was alleged to have told uh, Washington General, I'll storm hell if you lay down the plans. Peter had this type of warrior spirit. The thing is, Peter was not a good listener of Jesus and was not following the plans of Jesus, right? Jesus rebukes him and calls him Satan in uh, Matthew 16 for for wanting to stop the plan of God. Matthew 16 says this in verse 21, says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed. And on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and said, and began to rebuke him. So he's rebuking Jesus. Far be it from you, Lord. This will never happen to you. But he turned to and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you're not setting your mind on things of God, but on the things of man. Jesus also said, as we will read later, the kingdom of God is not one of violence, right? It's one of loving your enemies, of mercy, of doing good to those who hate you. Peter had ignored much of what Jesus said and was just ready to fight, and so were the rest of his disciples. And Jesus immediately rebukes this and says, no more of this, enough of this, all right? Then he compassionately heals 
his enemies, his oppressors here. It was the last miracle he did before the, uh, the cross. And we see in Jesus that we should respond to the attacks of the enemies with Christ-like love and compassion. Why did Jesus rebuke the disciples' attempts to protect him? Well, there are two main reasons for Jesus' rebuke here. One is that Jesus was not going to allow his disciples that we were just talking about, as well-intentioned as they were, to get in the way of God's plan of redemption. As horrible as the situation was, only Jesus knew that this was all part of the Father's good plan to save humanity from sin and death. As dark as it may seem, God has a plan in it, and they submit to God's plan instead of trying to handle it their way. Vengeance is the Lord's anyway, and it's better to follow God's will and persecution and trial than handling things your way. Jesus will work all things out for your good and his glory, even if you can't see it right now. In, the, in this case, they would have been attempting to stop God's plan for their redemption. It is the same reason Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan, as we read earlier. Any actions, no matter how well-intentioned, that sought to impede Jesus from the cross was from the pit of hell. And it was an action of darkness, and Jesus emphatically rejects it. The second re lesson we, uh, in how we should respond when we are persecuted um, uh, excuse me, and, and we are persecuted, and, um, is that we should have, we should do good to our enemies when we have the opportunity to. The first lesson before we get to that is a lesson of what not to do. It's not to respond to darkness to your enemies with the same reactionary, fleshly, violent response, responding with darkness with darkness, especially when you are persecuted by the hands of the state. Jesus, again, makes it clear that the kingdom was not to be advanced through violence or revolution, all right, against the state, but peace, mercy, and proclamation of the gospel of him giving his life as a ransom for all. Though we're not in a country at this time that persecutes us to, the, to this degree because of our uh, loyalty to Christ, there is still a general lesson here to resist the fleshly urge to respond to those who attack you or challenge you or hate you or threaten you with harshness, violent aggression, whether that be fer verbal or physical. When someone attacks you on social media, do not give them that same harshness back. It's so easy to do that when you're typing on social media. You can't see the person, you don't know the person, right? That's still sin, right? That's still against the kingdom lifestyle. When someone at your job is rude or out to get you, the response is not to see how you can make their lives miserable as well, right? When you get cursed out in traffic or get a nasty attitude by some Walmart worker or somebody at, you know, a fast food restaurant or whatever, I don't know. Followers of Jesus do not respond in the same dark fashion. In fact, our response should be one that shows the light of Christ in the midst of darkness. One that is merciful, that is peacemaking, that is gentle, that is seeking to restore even in the face of opposition. In the midst of being arrested by his enemies, Jesus takes time to show compassion and love here. He practices what he preaches. Love your enemies. Bless those who pers persecute you. Look back at Luke 6 real quick. Keep your place here, but look back at Luke 6. Starting in verse 27. Let's listen to this again. I know we went through a while back. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And, the, and from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Either, Give to everyone who begs from you, and from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. As, and as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you're good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those who lend from, uh, uh, from you, expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and, and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you'll be sons of the Most High. For, this, for he is kind to the ungrateful and evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Man, what if Jesus rewarded us with the same 
to the measure that we uh, are obedient to him. Whew, we would be in big trouble, right? Right? If Jesus had, um, oh, I'm not a morning person, so that's why I snapped, right? No, 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 no. We must, even when people get on our nerves, even when they're enemies, even when they're against us, this is how the disciples of Jesus in this dark world respond to hate and oppression. I know it's countercultural, but it's gospel culture. How do you handle oppositions? How do you handle when people are against you? Jesus did not even do the harm to this guy. He could have left his ear cut off, but given the opportunity to show kindness and grace to his enemy, he does it. The cross was the ultimate example of him showing the greatest example of kindness and mercy to his enemies. And this act was just a foreshadow of the cross. Listen, do you believe, I know we sang it, but do you believe that you were an enemy of God? There was nothing about us worth saving at all. We could have been left in our sin and judgment, and it would have been just. But God in his love saw you as an enemy of his and decided to die for you and make you his, his friend, his family. If, if Jesus can turn his enemies into his friends, we can have that same heart towards others. For those who hate us and seek our downfall. Listen, think about the people who get on your nerves the most. Think about the people who are against you, who hate you, your enemies. How often do you pray for them? Do you seek to do good to those who hate you, even though they don't deserve it? When the opportunity arises, have you tried to show them kindness? Or do you react with their evil with your own aggression? Yes, even passive aggression is included here. If we are honest, sometimes, let's, let's be honest, sometimes we want the downfall of our enemies and those who hate us more than we want true peace and restoration with them. We have taken an onward Christian soldier's attitude out of context. Yes, we are soldiers of the cross, but we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, and the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or earthly. And many professing Christians' idea of fighting for Jesus is just an excuse to act in the flesh for Jesus' sake. The best weapon against evil lawmakers or politicians is not you making a mockery on them online. Now, how about we pray for politicians who make evil policy more than we share means that bash them? How about we seek to be Christ-like peacemakers and love our neighbors well, even the ones who are against everything we stand for? I'm not saying this is easy. Responding to the darkness with the light of Christ is something that we need his grace for. This little light of mine, one of those verses is, Jesus gave it to me, right? <laughs> it's his light. We need his grace, his, his light, his power to let it shine. Run to Christ for strength to respond to, uh, to hate with love, to meanness with kindness, and to darkness with light. Lastly, we see that Jesus exposed the power of darkness, right? We see that through, that though darkness may arise in our lives, it's only for a season, and Jesus is the ultimate, Jesus has ultimate control of the darkness he allows. We see that though darkness may arise in our lives, it's only for a season, and Jesus has ultimate control over the darkness that he allows. The light of Jesus will ultimately power through darkness. Look at verses 52 and 53. We're almost done. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers and the temple elders who had come out against him, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Evil men work under the guise of darkness often, right? Jesus exposes them as hypocrites and cowardly worker, workers of evil, of, uh, of the evil of darkness. All these men are just hypocrites and cowards, really, all right? Jesus like, all you men with authority who come at me with armed with swords and clubs as if I'm some robber or some revolutionary leading a violent rebellion. The hypocrisy is expressly evident because these men were the real com criminals committing injustice in the cover of night to an innocent man who had never preached violence or acted violently. They all had all this authority. I mean, they were the chief priests. These were the temple police. These were the elders. And yet they wait in the cover of darkness in the middle of the night away from the crowds to arrest Jesus. All that earthly authority, yet they were afraid to exercise it in public in front of the people, but had to arrest Jesus in the middle of the night. 
Jesus exposes their hypocrisy and cowardice, arresting him in the cover of night, coming with a group of armed men as Jesus is some criminal. Yet they were doing the real injustice. One commentator said, the physical darkness of the night matched and covered the moral darkness reigning in their hearts. Jesus exposes also their real lack of power, lack of power and authority. Let's, let's them know that this is your hour when darkness reigns. I will allow you to have this season to do your works because he knows that it will be used to fulfill God's ultimate plan. All right? And this is only an hour, right? It's a time period. Darkness has a time limit, not literally an hour, but the point is that darkness has a time limit. It will one day be gone. And it's important to note here, Jesus is not taken captive against his will, right? It's not like Jesus tried to, no, don't arrest me, right? No, no, no. Jesus allows them to arrest him. He willingly submits their plan, knowing that he was fulfilling the Father's ultimate plan of redemption. Some of you guys have read stories and seen TV shows. Have you got this mastermind who allows the authorities to arrest them because he knows it's all part of his plan to release things or, you know, start something or something like that? Right? Jesus is omni, omniscient, and he's complete in control, so everything that they did was all part of his ultimate plan. There was nothing that could, that, happened, that could have happened if he didn't allow it. Listen, folks, if Jesus is calm and in control in the midst of the greatest trial of all time, you must be calm and at peace when you face trials as well. You may not know, know the specifics of how it would turn out, but you do know that you are God's child and he loved you. And whatever the devil and this world throws at you, it will bow to God's ultimate plan for your good and his glory. Do not respond in the flesh. Do not get impatient in trial. Trust that Jesus has a large plan for you. And in the midst of your trial, know that one day you will praise him for this, Right? And praise him for what he's doing. Another lesson we see from this is that the power that although the power of darkness reigns now, it will be only for a season, and when and one day that hour of darkness will be over, and the light of Jesus will shine forever. You see, for a moment, the evil men acting in darkness seem to rule today. The devil and those he it was influenced seem to have the upper hand. But what they did not know that after they done their worst, Jesus would have the last say. He would be crucified, yes, but then he would be resurrected. He would be enthroned at his father's right hand. You see, the worst trial, the darkest times in your lives are only temporary. Your best life is not now. It may look like evil is winning. That trials and temptations are never ending. And you're like, Lord, one thing after another. But one day, Jesus will put an end to all of it. Whether it be darkness at your, because of your enemies or physical pain or whatever that you're going through, Jesus will crush it all. The light of Jesus will last forever, and we have to trust that. It's only for a season. Again, one of the themes here in this text is that Jesus rises from this intense session of prayer, and he is no longer shaking, but he's resolute, he's bold, he's in complete control despite being arrested as authorities. And Jesus wants us to have that type of calm. He's in control, and this is only temporary. I do not know what type of trials and temptations or darkness that you may be facing this morning. It may be heavy and feel unbearable, but I know that your mighty Savior is in complete loving control, and he can give you peace in that trial. Though Jesus was arrested, his light shone through. He shows compassion in response to unlawful arrest. He submits to the plan of the Father despite the pain it would temporarily cause. Jesus is the true light in the midst of darkness. Church, in this life, we're going to experience darkness in the form of temptations, trials, attacks, from the enemy, but by God's grace, let us respond to the darkness of this world with the light of Jesus. Can you pray to ask us, us to do that?